And uh, Saroj had this idea, and I knew Mike Searle from Geology from Earth Science has given some, some talks on this in, as part of a fundraiser. And I think he's raised over 8,000 pounds at Eight this point. 8,000 pounds, that's right. 8,000 yeah. pounds for earthquake relief in Nepal. So he's going to talk, talk about this today. Also, I understand it's being recorded and, and uh, it's going to be uh, have a nice audience in Nepal as well. As oh, really? Yeah. Oh, better watch what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay, thanks very much, Troy, and uh, thanks yeah. for having me. So, um, does this work? Yeah, it should work. I'm not going to hook that up somewhere. Sorry? Um, it should be working. Um, I don't know, do you want to put it in the pocket okay. somewhere? Okay, sure, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I'm sure you're all aware. Maybe we can just slap these blinds a bit. The is on the <laughs> Oh, is it? Okay. Okay, I'm sure you're all aware of um, pointer of um, the earthquake that went off in Nepal uh, recently. I've been uh, going to Nepal for about 20 something years now, almost every year. Uh, I'm across the way in geology, and we've had a big project uh, looking at the geology of the Himalayas. So I've worked in just about every area of Nepal except for the far west, and. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the earthquake and the effects it has on Kathmandu and what, on uh, Nepal and uh, how we think things may develop in the future. So um, the earthquake went off uh, 25th of April. Uh, luckily it was on a Saturday and it was in the afternoon. It could have been an awful lot worse if it had gone off at night or during the monsoon or during school time when all the kids are in school and people are indoors. It could have been, the death toll could have been double, triple, quadruple what it was. So in some aspects, the, uh, it was actually quite lucky that it went off when it did. It was a very large earthquake, magnitude 7.8, but it was not the big one, which we know is going to go off at some stage. And the big one, I mean something like 8.2, 8.3, 8.4. It's a log scale, the earthquake, so uh, it's 10 times every time you go up a, a notch. The earthquake also uh, started off at a depth of 15 kilometers, which is quite shallow. And it was on the main thrust fault where India is moving underneath the Himalayas. It's how the Himalayas have been formed for the last 50 million years of earthquakes like this. So it happens, it's not unusual, it happens all the time. And the big ones happen on about a 40, uh, sorry, about a 70 to 100 year time slot. So the last big earthquake that went off in eastern Nepal was 1934, the Bihar East Nepal earthquake. And that pretty much destroyed Kathmandu. Uh, it had incredible damage all over East Nepal. It was felt as far south as Calcutta. And that is what, that was an 8.3, and that was one of the largest earthquakes in the eastern Himalayas for the last 100 years. During this earthquake, there was a horizontal slip of nearly five meters. So the rocks at 15 kilometers underneath Kathmandu moved five meters horizontally in three seconds. The fault ruptured about 150 kilometers long strike. It ruptured, do we have a pointer somewhere? Um, or maybe I can stick or something. Uh, it ruptured in uh, right underneath Gorka, which is right at the top. And it very surprisingly only went in one direction. So when the earthquake epicenter goes off, it normally, or usually it goes in both directions, as happened in the Kashmir earthquake. This one, it ruptured in Gorkha and it went only east. Everything to the west of Gorkha was pretty much unaffected. Uh, to the area to the north of Kathmandu rose by about 1.2 meters in three seconds. And again, Kathmandu was very lucky because that rise happened very steadily. It was a very low intensity shaking earthquake and high intensity earthquakes would have flattened the city. Um, so again, that was another lucky factor in this. 
The real problem is that the earthquake did not rupture to the surface. When you have a large earthquake like that, it normally nucleates at the brittle ductile transition, which can be anywhere around 20, 15 kilometers depth. This is the, the bit of the fault that ruptured. And uh, it's taken a week of very intense work to get these depths of all the epicenters of the aftershocks going. So we know that the earthquake initiated down here and it ruptured all the way up to the northern side of the Kathmandu Valley, but it did not uh, hit the surface. Thanks. Um, doesn't work. Oh, hang on. Let's try that. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, so um, the, the earthquake epicenter was, whoops, what have I done? The earthquake epicenter was underneath Gorkha, which is here. This is an oblique aerial view. Tibet is over here, India is down here, and the Kathmandu Valley is in here. And it's color shaded for the amount of uplift of the land. This is instantaneous uplift within two and a half seconds. So the land immediately to the north of the Kathmandu Valley, up here, uh, rose by about 1.2 meters in three seconds, and the fault ruptured from Gorkha all the way east to this region here, again in about three seconds. Uh, the big problem was that the fault did not rupture to the surface. What we expected was that the strain would have come up one of these active faults down in the Tarai, near Chituan. The nice big folds you see in the dunes at Chituan, that's where the active fault is today. Uh, but unfortunately, this earthquake did not rupture to the surface. So this land under here moved by five meters, and it means that the stress is all still down there. It's all still waiting to rupture. And it will rupture at some stage, but like every earthquake, we know roughly where we can expect it to go off, but we will never know when. It is impossible to predict earthquakes, uh, despite what you hear in the press sometimes. Um, so here's a map of the uh, epicenters. This actually, we did this map uh, three days after the earthquake went off. On the, that was the epicenter underneath Gorkha. This is the Burigandaki Valley, which heads up to Manaslu. And this is the Annapurna circuit round here. This is the Kaligandaki, that's Daulagiri. Beni is down here. Jomasam is up here. Mustang is up here. And everywhere to the west of the Burigandaki escaped pretty much fine. Pokhara, very little damage. Um, the worst damage was in the hill country in the Ganesh Himal over here to the east of the Burigandaki and around Kathmandu. And there's various reasons why Kathmandu was damaged uh, severely like that. There's a lot more aftershocks. Uh, this is a two week old uh, figure at the moment. Uh, this is a satellite a synthetic aperture radar uh, picture again looking obliquely down at the Kathmandu Valley um, and this is done by John Elliott who's spent the last three weeks re-analyzing all of the earthquakes, all of the aftershocks and all of the INSAR data and INSAR you can basically have two satellites looking at the same topography and you can figure out by using before and after the earthquake how much land has moved up. So all, oops sorry, all of this area here, this is just noise. So, uh, yeah, all, all of these figures here is just noise, but each one of these contours is the land going up. So the Kathmandu Valley is there, and the area that rose by about 1.3 meters is centered immediately to the north of Kathmandu. And it's very strange because the epicenter was over here in Gorkha, and the fault ruptured eastwards and not westwards which is a little bit of a worry because the two areas now at uh, risk are to the area to the south of Kathmandu. If the fault actually ramps up and ruptures, it should go up the most active fault, which is the one down in Chitwan, the main frontal thrust, or these two. All three of these are very low angle thrust faults and the main boundary thrust is the main topographic divide. So this is the big thrust that's been active for the last uh, seven million years and this is the one that puts very old Precambrian rocks above very young rocks of the Tarai. Uh, 
most of the work I've been doing is up here in the high Himalayas in Langtang and Ganesh and Annapurna and Manaslu looking at the granites and these are much older. All of these faults here were active sorry, at um, all of these faults here were active uh, during the late Miocene period about 20 million years ago. 20 to 15 million years ago and like all mountain belts the faults are propagating southwards with time. So I'm sure you've all seen pictures of all the destruction in Kathmandu. Kathmandu is built on an old lake sediment from when the Himalayas started uh, rising to the north and the Panjal range in the south started rising. It actually trapped a lot of the rivers flowing south from the Himalayas and it built up this huge lake. So the entire Kathmandu Valley is old lake sediment. The rivers have now breached through the frontal ranges so they go south down into the Terai. Uh, lake sediments are about the worst base rock you can have on an earthquake because when you propagate seismic waves through it, it basically becomes a liquid. The Mexico City earthquake, which was a lot less than this, killed 100,000 people because Mexico City is also built on an old lake bed and the whole thing liquefied and all the buildings fell down. But again, Kathmandu was very lucky because the shaking intensity of this earthquake was very low, given the size of it. However, a lot of uh, buildings did fall down, but quite amazingly, buildings didn't. And I'm sure if you've all been to Kathmandu, you know the buildings in Tamil, where all the backpacker hotels are. There's no building codes there at all. Half the walls aren't straight, and every time I sit on the roof of one of those hotels, I think this place is going to crumble in the next earthquake. And amazingly, Tamil survived, um, not in tax, but it survived much better than we thought. But overall, this earthquake has killed at least 9,000 people. It's injured thousands more. At least 500,000 homes are damaged or destroyed. And more than 3 million people are left homeless. The World Bank now estimates that we need $6.5 billion to reconstruct Nepal to the state it was before the earthquake. So this is a pretty serious sum of money. Um, and I'm sure, again, you've all seen pictures of the famous Harahara Towers and a lot of the, the sites in Durba Square, which were damaged and have fallen down. A lot of these World Heritage sites were, um, amazingly, um, survived some of the 1934 destruction of the Bihar earthquake, but fell down here. And yet some of these modern buildings stood. So it's quite bizarre, and there's teams of engineers out there at the moment going around looking at the damage and the cracks of all the buildings around this area to figure out why some buildings fell down and why others didn't. But it's a very important um, engineering problem that uh, the, these are the people that are needed out there urgently now as the expert engineers and builders to reconstruct these buildings in the right way. Previous to this, despite all of the warnings, the Nepalese government has had these warnings for 25 years, that there will be a big earthquake. Um, there is absolutely no building regulation at all. Anybody in Tamil can put another story on the house. And every year I go back, it seems they're rising up to the fifth, sixth levels. Uh, so it was very sad to see some of these fabulous old buildings and the Nawari temples uh, collapse. But, you know, if there's one thing that mankind's very good at, it's reconstruction. And UNESCO in particular, I'm sure, will put a lot of money into reconstructing the heritage sites of Kathmandu. Um, and it's received an awful lot of uh, publicity. Um, but as I said, Kathmandu was very lucky. This earthquake was nowhere near big enough to release the stress that we know is down there. And if it was an 8.2 or an 8.3, almost every building you see in this picture would have fallen down. And you know the density of population in Kathmandu is quite, uh, is very, very dense. So there are streets where they've had appalling damage like this, but there's also streets where there's been very little damage. And this, this is the classic picture um, of people being dragged out of rubble uh, after several days buried there. Now the worst damage in the earthquake actually, I, I believe, I was due to fly out to Kathmandu the week after the earthquake, going up to the Annapurna base camp, and of course we had to cancel. But um, 
I have been in touch very regularly with friends in Kathmandu and Pokhara and in the hill villages in Ganesh. And I think a lot of the hill villages have been the worst affected. Um, I don't know if you've seen pictures of this, Laprak village. There's two villages up here, Laprak and Barpak, where almost every single house was destroyed. This is on the west side of the Burigandaki, just north of Gorkha, north of Varagat Bazaar. And um, this was almost directly above the epicenter. And yet you go to the Marciandi, the next big valley to the west, which is only 15, 20 kilometers west, and there is almost very, very little destruction. So you can tell a lot from the seismic waves that propagated out of this earthquake um, in terms of what, what was the, the damage, the collateral damage to all of this. Now, as I said, I've been going out to Nepal for well over 20 years now in my research, and I started off the first five or six times on climbing expeditions. And in the last 10 years, we've always used porters and siddhar from this village, uh, Kashigami. Yasa, which is again about a day's walk north of Aragat Bazaar. It's a lovely little village and all our porters have become really good friends. And when I contacted them after the earthquake, uh, there was about 50% destruction in this village. Laprak and Barpak are the other side of the Burigandaki over here. So we decided, previous to this, we'd been trying to raise money to build a school there uh, because this is this village sort of uh, is a center for about 10 villages all around the upper Aragat Bazaar area of Gorka. And uh, this is one of our Siddhars, uh, Sukha, who's now organizing the fundraising for this. And three of them immediately went and opened a bank account for the village in Pokhara. And myself in this country and some friends in Australia are raising money. And we, we are able to send money direct into that bank account and then these guys go out, buy up all the rice and the uh, tents, tarpaulins, tin roofs, whatever they need, and carry it up to the village. So these two guys have done about six trips up to the village now, carrying supplies for um, all of whatever they need. And the latest uh, trip, they've gone, hired a truck to go down to India and buy up corrugated iron tin roofs because the monsoon has just broken and a lot of people uh, are still sleeping in the open. They're very worried about earthquakes. There's aftershocks going, uh, you know, every day. And uh, a lot of the houses that weren't collapsed are actually cracked and um, unlivable in. So our plan is to um, basically, you know, there's so much needs doing in Nepal and the big guys, Red Cross, all these people are working sort of in Kathmandu in the big centres. But a lot of people I know of, climbers in particular, have sort of, in, you know, uh, got one village or one valley and they're actually raising money for that specific valley and I think it actually works really well. Quite amazingly uh, Suka managed to get a helicopter up there, Nepalese army helicopter the day after the earthquake and I spoke to him on Skype after that and he was absolutely devastated. He said my village is gone and the valleys on the ones on the other side have completely collapsed. So we're now busy raising money, trying to rebuild the village, and then hopefully uh, the school that we'd started before. And uh, a lot of these hill villages are, um, have received almost no help from the central government, quite, you know, without any criticism, because they're very remote, and there's a lot of other people in heavily populated areas of Kathmandu and Langtang, for example. So a lot of the locals are taking it in themselves to go there and it's actually created a fantastically communal spirit which Nepalis always had before and uh, everyone is clubbing together, the villagers are going up to help their neighbours and uh, I think a lot of good is coming out of this. But we've sent money directly over to them uh, on a sort of personal basis, just bank account to bank account, but now it's all going to go through Community Action Nepal which is a charity that the climber Doug Scott set up about 25 years ago. He was the first Brit to climb Everest. He loves Nepal, he's been there about 60 times. And Can has raised money over the last 20 years to build about 70 schools right across the hill country of Nepal. Um, there's this charity and Edmund Hillary's Himalayan Trust, which works mainly in the, sh in the Sherpa country in eastern Nepal. 
Doug's charity works where all the porters come from in the Tamang villages and the Rai villages and the lower down. They're a really fantastic outfit. Doug is an amazing person. He does lecture tours all around the country every year. Royal Geographic Society here. There's a big one in November. And 100% of the money raised goes straight to Nepal. There's no other fees whatsoever. Everyone else is, um, is doing it for charity. So as I said, this is not the big one, which everyone was expecting. There is, we know how the Himalayas are forming because India and Asia are colliding together and India is moving underneath Asia and the boundary is the fault which ruptures every, all the time. So we know that the strain that was built up since the 1934 Bihar earthquake is big enough to produce about an 8.2. And we had predict, not we, not me, but geodesists working in Nepal had predicted that Kathmandu was right on the epicenter of a strain gap. Uh, so we were expecting this and the government knew about this. Uh, the schools had all drills. It's a very impressive but by the time you've got a city the size of Kathmandu with no building regulations, what can the government do? Not much. So I'm not criticising the government, it's just, uh, just a statement of fact. But I think now is the time where they're going to have to rebuild all of these cracked buildings, reconstruct uh, buildings that have collapsed, is to bring in building regulations, which are feasible to do. There's a few very simple things you can do the engineers know much more about this than I do, uh, to prevent earthquake damage. So countries like California or Japan or Taiwan, which are rich countries, their buildings sway in the breeze. So California has five, six earthquakes every year and very, very little damage, very few people killed. Japan has huge earthquakes every year. Tokyo, Kobe, not many people killed. There are things you can do in uh, re in countries like Nepal, simple things like putting girdles around houses uh, to prevent them collapsing inwards and um, that's all in the realms of the engineers who are working on this right now. But there are a few things that um, we can think about. Uh, one is that um, because Kathmandu, Nepal only has one international airport at Kathmandu, a lot of the problem was they raised a huge amount of money the week after the earthquake, massive amount of money. Can alone raised £100,000 just from the climbing, trekking community in Britain. And these supplies were all taken out to Kathmandu and they couldn't get the supplies out of Kathmandu. First out of the airport because of bureaucracy. Secondly, out of the Kathmandu Valley. There's one road going east, one road going west, one south, and they're all single track roads. If you've ever tried to get the bus from Kathmandu to Pokhara, you're stuck in a horrendous traffic jam going down these zigzags all the way. So they really need, firstly, to build another airport, international airport. If there was an international airport at Pokhara, they could have flown aid direct into both airports and the Pokhara one would have got up to Gorka and the hill country in no time. So that is, should be number one priority, to build an international airport at Pokhara. Secondly, they need to upgrade the roads. The roads are um, in a terrible state there. They've had no repairs at all and they're far too, they're not strong enough to uh, maintain the traffic. Um, the Nepali army, from all accounts, did an amazingly good job. The, uh, they were very short of supplies uh, and a lot of other people went up too. I know there was a British army contingent up in Gorkha region I think they were mostly up in the Laprak area. Um, and, um, but there were other stories as well, like the British government um, sending out these Chinook helicopters, which would have been fantastic, you know, based in Pokhara, getting up supplies straight up to these hill villages in the country. Um, so what needs to be done? Well, this is very clear what needs to be done. Uh, new International Airport is number one improve the road networks in and out of Kathmandu and build in, put in building regulations that are abided by. Uh, the politicians also need to be aware they were, the government was incredibly slow in making the new emergency disaster management plan 
and uh, a lot of the time they were stymied simply by the lack of transport, lack of roads and lack of helicopters. The only way to get up to the hill villages uh, in an emergency like this is helicopters, so they need more and more helicopters up there. And again, education. All Nepalis need to know what to do in an earthquake, get outside the building and all of that. So um, that's really the earthquake. I'm just going to show you a few pictures now from around Nepal. Uh, the, long, the bigger picture, why are the Himalayas there? Why do we get earthquakes? So this is a picture taken from the space shuttle looking roughly over Kathmandu, looking west. These are all the high peaks of the Himalayas. This is India, this is Pakistan, and this is Tibet. And India and Asia collided along a suture zone which runs all the way across southern Tibet into Ladakh. It's this line here. That was the remnants of the ocean that once lay between India and Tibet. And then the main northern part of the Himalayas here is all the upper crust, the sedimentary rocks which are folded. And the high Himalayas is all this deep crustal metamorphic rocks which are thrusting to the south. The active fault is this one here, the main boundary thrust, and this has been seismically active for the last five, six million years, and this is where the earthquake ruptured from Pokhara, which is about, uh, sorry, from Gorka, which is about there eastwards. All of this part of the Himalayas ruptured, but it did not break to the surface, which is the worrying thing. Um, so that's a cartoon of the India under thrusting the Himalayas and keeping it up. The high Himalayas is all around this region here. And uh, here's a sketch map of uh, what's going on. So Everest and Annapurna and all these big mountains are up in this region. But the active fault is the one down in the Terai, the southern boundary of the Himalayas. And this is moving at about five centimeters a year relative to Tibet. So the strain stress taken up in the Himalayas, about five centimeters a year. That is a lot of motion north-south, which needs to be released by these big earthquakes. Okay, a few pictures of Nepal. This is the Nilgiri Mountains. This is how you make the Himalayas. There's one huge great fold in the Nilgiri Peaks. The Kaligandaki is down here. This is just above Marfa village, for anyone who knows that area. Um, and this is from Poon Hill, looking west to Dolagiri, one of the 8,000 meter peaks. And all of this is the high grade metamorphic rocks that I'm working on. The entire Himalayas in this section here is upside down. So all the high grade stuff that should be deep is forming these higher peaks. And as you come south, you're getting shallower and shallower rocks, which is the inverted sense of what you should expect. If you drill a hole under here, you will increase pressure and temperature and you'll get rocks like these at about 30 kilometers depth. Instead of which in the Himalayas everything is upside down because you've had these huge folds and thrusts. And that's how the Himalayas have formed. This is Dolagiri and uh, there, this is the roof of that big extrusion zone and we can now take min rocks and minerals and get pressures and temperatures, depth, and we can even date the rocks using uranium lead isotopes to get time. So this fault here is not active anymore, but during the period from 20 to about 15 million years ago, it was moving very, very fast and making big earthquakes like the one we've seen today, uh, recently. Uh, this is Mashapuchari, the fishtail. This is the Modicola going up to Annapurna base camp up here. This is a fabulous mountain just to the north of Pokhara. This is the trek we were gonna do uh, the week after the earthquake, which is postponed to next year now. And uh, moving further east, this is Langtang Lirung. Uh, the very first trip I did to Nepal in 1980, we climbed a route from Langtang village all the way up here, and our high point was up about here. And I'll show you some pictures of the landslide that buried Langtang recently. It basically went straight down the route we spent a month climbing up in 1980. Um, this is taken on that expedition, looking west towards Gangchempo and the Jugal Himal. Absolutely fabulous mountains up there. Really one of the most spectacular places. And this was one of the saddest sights of the whole earthquake for me, because we had spent literally uh, six weeks camping right there. Our route, climbing route went up here. 
And that is now a huge rock and ice avalanche that buried the entire village. Three stories high, the whole village has gone. No survivors. Everyone in that village died. And they're just starting to uh, get the bodies out now. And there's some tragic stories here. There was one house that survived, which is that one, tucked into the cliff. And all of this is new rock slide that is three stories high. It's as big as this building, just massive, great avalanche. And it went straight down the gully that we climbed up here. This is what the village looked like before the earthquake. It was an absolutely lovely place. I had some very good friends who lived there, ran lodges down in Langtang, and uh, absolutely tragic. When we were there, we saw avalanches coming down all the time. This is just a couple of little small ones coming down the south face. But this one um, would have been much, much worse, and mostly rock, not snow. Uh, this was on one of our camps up on the south face of Langtang, uh, looking across. And the, the part that landslid was basically all of this material here just went straight down the valley. And this is the view from that camp looking down the gully, this gully here where the, the landslide came. But you can see the very, very steep Langtang um, valley going here. This is looking up towards Kanjingompa at the top. Kanjingompa's up here. And uh, we've done a lot of work up here. I have a PhD student who's actually working on this right now, and we've been here for the last two years. So this was really quite a, a major shock. This is the Langtang Valley here, Langtang Lirong. That's the avalanche trace down there. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing that hit the news was Everest Base Camp, just because it was full of Western climbers. Um, this was different. This was largely an uh, ice avalanche, where, which broke off. Of course, when the earthquake happened, all the high mountains, which are 100 kilometers north of that, uh, they were shaking, and that will loosen rock and create huge amounts of avalanche. So th this one on Everest was mostly ice, the entire Serac up here on the low La, this is on the uh, Everest base camp on the Nepalese side here, that's, Pumor that's uh, Ling Tren, and Tibet is over the other side. And there's this enormous great Serac that collapsed, and uh, it created this air blast that went straight through base camp. This is base camp down here, you can probably see about 100 tents, red tents, and there were 20 or 30 people killed at base camp. And uh, the other thing that that avalanche did was actually block the climbing routes up through the Western Coon. So all the climbers that were high on Everest in Camp 1 and Camp 2 were trapped up there. They couldn't get back down. And there was a lot of helicopter ferrying people from Camp 1 at the top of the icefall back to Gorak Shep. Um, and that is the extreme limit that helicopters can fly at. It's about 5,200 metres, and you can only get one or two people in a helicopter to get the uh, air enough to lift it off. So that was quite a major uh, component. This is in better times flying out of Kathmandu towards uh, the east and the beautiful peaks of uh, Nupsi, sorry, Nupsi, Nupsi, Lhotse and Everest, and that's Makalu, fourth highest peak. Manaslu, another beautiful 8,000 meter peak up in the Gorkha. And uh, Amadablan, this is up near Everest, on the south side of Everest. And uh, a few aerial pictures here of some of these absolutely spectacular mountains. Um, I've made a map of um, Everest. I've got some here, uh, if anyone would like one. Um, I'm actually raising money for the Kashigang village, so £10 charge you. But this is the, map, the geological map of Everest with a lot of pictures in. Um, and uh, this is the peak of Makalu in the Baron Valley and Kanchenjunga in the far east of Nepal. Third highest peak on the, in the world. Absolutely fabulous mountains altogether. So going back to the uh, Annapurna area, this is um, just north of, Katma, of Pokhara. Uh, 
this is one of the little planes that is the Avia Flying Club in Pokhara fly up and down. And uh, I know the pilot is a Russian guy who um, works for them. And uh, he takes tourists regularly up and down to Jomasum or around Mashapuchari. And I've flown with them about three times. Um, the most recent one was in 2012 when this was not caused by an earthquake, but the entire side of Annapurna 4 basically collapsed in a huge rock slide. And all of this is avalanche landslide debris resulting from the collapse of that face. And amazingly, um, this guy happened to be flying up there when it happened. So he had his camera and he was looking out of the, the uh, air, airplane and he saw this massive great cloud of dust and rock at the top of the Seti Kola, just north of Pokhara. And um, he managed to radio back to the air tower in Pokhara, get an emergency message out on the radio that there's a huge landslide coming down the Seti Kola, people should get out of the valley. But of course they had, they actually had two days notice because the landslide blocked the river down here and the water built up to a big lake and it took two days to burst the lake and then the whole thing fell down with the most fantastic flood down the Seti Kola. So this is uh, Max, this Russian pilot chap who's been flying around Nepal for the last 10 years. He's a great guy. English is not great, but... Um, and then this is the um, Karapani disaster. This is the Seti Kola uh, during the flood. This is when the floodgates burst and the whole thing swept down the Seti Kola. And you can see here, there's one, two, three levels, terraces, where there's houses and people. And this was the next day when the river had subsided, a, sorry, a few days afterwards. These houses are completely buried. These ones are completely buried or washed away, and the upper ones survived. Uh, there were about 20-odd people killed in that, including some Russian tourists who were down at, there's a hot spring down there. Um, and then the Seti actually flows into Pokhara, and this is an aerial picture of Pokhara. This is the great gorge that the Seti flows into, and all of this stuff here is all the mud that came out of the Seti Kola landslide. So the drinking water was affected for months afterwards. And, uh, but this was just one little small avalanche that uh, came off uh, one little pass of the Annapurna range. And it's been happening for a long time in the past. These are old lake sediments up here. Annapurna 4 is up here. This is where the landslide came down. This is bedrock. But all of this material here is old lake sediment. That's probably only 100,000 years old. And at some stage, this dam must have burst at the top of the Seti Kola and created yet another huge flood. So Pokhara has been, had 100,000 years of floods coming down all of these valleys, the Modi Kola, the Seti Kola, the, all of them, to make the Pokhara Lake sediments that are down in the Pokhara Valley. And the same with Kathmandu. So it's a standard way that uh, the Himalayas are forming. You're continually uplifting the mountains. The rivers are being dammed, flooded, floods are burst, and they flow down eventually into the Terai, where there are huge sediments in the Terai in the Ganges Basin. And the Ganges takes everything out to the Bay of Bengal. The sediments derived from the Himalayas as far south as Sri Lanka in the Bay of Bengal and as far south as Kenya on the other side coming from the Karakoram. So this is the power of these rivers to transport this material away. But uh, Kathmandu, Nepal is such a wonderful country. Everybody that goes there loves it. Fantastic mountains and fantastic people. And they really need all the help they can get from us. Thank you very much. Yes. I mean, you didn't, presumably people don't know why it went east, not west at all. Uh, and, but you must have some theory that you want to work on. Um, well, I, I'm not a seismologist. I, I work on rocks, not earthquakes. But I, my office 
opposite is full of seismologists, and I keep asking them questions exactly like that. And uh, they don't really have an answer. Some earthquakes do that. The Sumatra earthquake, 2003 Boxing Day earthquake, Epicenter was just off uh, Banda Aceh in Sumatra, and that ruptured for 1,200 kilometers in one direction, straight north to Burma. Nothing went east. And underneath the Andaman Islands, that fault ruptured 15 meters. The Andaman Islands themselves tilted, so Port Blair went up. Uh, sorry, Port Blair went down two meters, and the other side of the islands went up. So all the, fl all the roads going to Port Blair are flooded, and uh, it was an absolutely extraordinary earthquake. That was an oceanic earthquake, which are always much bigger. But then all the, a lot of the seismologists said, um, oh, well, that's a huge 8.3. That's taken up all the strain for the whole of the eastern Indian Ocean. Three months later, another earthquake, 8.1, went off on Nias Island, which is about 30 kilometers from the epicenter of the other one. And that went east. So between the, those two earthquakes, everything has ruptured from eastern Java all the way up to Burma. Now that has major connotations for this one, because if this earthquake ruptured from Gorkha eastwards, there is quite a danger that that strain is going to either hit the surface to the south of Kathmandu, which is where it should have gone in the last earthquake, but didn't, or from the area that didn't rupture to the west of the epicenter. In other words, Gorkha to Pokhara to the west. So the two areas that are in danger, and again, we don't know when, you know, nothing should be um, said in terms of prediction. This is not, not, not earthquake prediction. It is impossible to predict earthquakes. All we can say is that the strain has been taken up under Kathmandu and that could be good for another 50, 60, 70 years, like the Bihar earthquake. But it has not been taken up in the Gorkha Pokhara area. The last major earthquake in West Nepal was 1550, and that was about an 8.0, but it's very difficult to be precise. Uh, well, it's no more than it was before okay. this earthquake, but it's, um, you know, it hasn't moved. Kathmandu has moved. It's gone up and it's moved five metres to the south. Gorkha hasn't moved anywhere and Pokhara hasn't moved anywhere. And as far as people know, it's not necessarily under less tension. No, the stress is big. I mean, it, it, the stress is the same all the way along the Himalayas from... Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim, Bhutan, all the way to Zanskar. We know that the India-Asia convergence is 5.5 centimetres a year. And most of that <coughs> is being taken up within the Himalayas. And in, within the Himalayas, the active fault at the south is where it's rupturing. And that happens everywhere. The Kashmir earthquake, 2005, that killed 100,000 people on the India-Pakistan border. But that did hit the surface, so there were huge... Um, spectacular pictures of um, houses where the thrust tip lined into the surface and these houses moved up three meters and then fell over and uh, but this one didn't hit the surface so um, if it wasn't for all the horrible death and destruction this is a fantastically interesting earthquake and to figure it out what we're trying to do is to figure out between the active earthquake people who are looking at INSAR and satellite interferometry to so people like me who are looking at long-term geology and uh, we can hopefully gain some insights into where where it's going to go next Maybe they can't predict, but yeah. can't predict. You, you, the press loves prediction and they misquoted all sorts of people about this especially in India I was interviewed in by an Indian journalist which was published in the Hindu about six months ago and um, she asked me a question and I, um, I said exactly what I've said to you that we, we know what the relative strain is between India and Tibet and we know that the last major earthquake in East Nepal was 1934 and therefore this area 
has still not seen a major earthquake for over 100 years. And uh, then I made this quote saying, Kathmandu is a disaster waiting to happen because it's in the center of the strange shadow. So she <laughs> blasted this in headlines all straight after this earthquake. Oxford geologists predicted this earthquake. <laughs> I didn't predict it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, what we can do is give a map of where it's where strain has gone and where it hasn't gone. But never when. When is impossible. But you said, I mean, that this isn't a big one, but in terms of one's of folk, <laughs> physics, if you like, the fact that there have been over 300 aftershocks, one kind of wants to believe that 350 aftershocks add up to releasing equivalent strain of the big one. Oh, unfortunately. Uh, well, unfortunately not. I mean, there are all big earthquakes like that will have months of aftershocks. The Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand, there's aftershocks going off still now, four years after the earthquake. That's a different fault altogether. It's a strike slow. But having aftershocks is very common. The day after, on the 26th of April, there were three 6.7s went off around Gorka. And the people, I was actually on Skype to the guy in Pokhara, and uh, his whole office started shaking. And he immediately just stopped, ran outside. Um, so you, the, the, the strength of the aftershocks tails off with time. But about a week afterwards, there was a huge aftershock, 7.5. And that was in the Rolwaling Himalaya, which was again very bizarre because it was nowhere near. It was the other end of the rupture from the um, 25th of April earthquake. But, the, but that area between Gorka and um, Everest is the strain has been released. But the area to the south it hasn't, and the area to the west it hasn't. Why are all the earthquakes happening in the east? Oh, they're not. They're happening all over. Pakistan has. That's western Nepal. Yeah, well, that's, that's where the big strain gap is. Everywhere really between Gorka and um, Western Nepal, that's the area that has not had a major earthquake. So Bihar, Arunachal Pradesh is, might be okay for another 70 years, we don't know. It, you know, it could be 10 years, it could be 110 years, it could be 1,000 years, we just don't know. Pakistan has had a huge earthquake, the Kashmir earthquake, but that was very restricted to the boundary around Muzaffarabad, Kashmir. Um, and there's a lot of complications going on immediately to the west of that. So um, Pakistan is all, always having earthquakes. The Hindu Kush is the most seismically active part of the world. There's a magnitude seven earthquake every month in the Hindu Kush on the border of Pakistan, Afghanistan. But those are really deep earthquakes where the Indian plate is diving down. And uh, it's very restricted. It's about 100 kilometers long. And they go down, the earthquakes go down to about 300 kilometers depth, which is absolutely phenomenal. Sure. So I have a couple of questions. One about the science. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a general agreement about that it is basically impossible to predict earthquakes. Yes. There was somebody, okay, there was somebody at the Himalayan fundraiser a few weeks ago. Mm. It, it was you. Yeah, <laughs> the one in Hartford College. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was me. Okay. Uh, the second question was on the politics slightly, and I appreciate that you tried uh, you know, to keep the politics out of it, right? Mm. Uh, but I was wondering then, I was curious a bit about your recommendation that the disaster relief uh, mm -hmm. sort of preparation be under the army. I mean, I appreciate you know, like the, the cutters and you know, the people on the ground did a lot, and that's well documented. Yeah. But as you mentioned, that was true of all my bodies, not just the army. Yeah. But decisions like the Chino, for instance, showed the politicization of the bureaucracy within the army. Yes. And so I was wondering why you decided to do that. Well, I, I'm not very f 